On his podcast this week, Joe Rogan hailed Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s position on the COVID-19 vaccine and blasted the media for working to keep him quiet. Here's a bit of that. And they'll say that Bobby Kennedy is spreading misinformation where everything he said, you can verify. Everything he said is true, yeah. but there's no money in agreeing with him. The amount of money that these news or organizations, supposed news organizations get from being on the side of the pharmaceutical companies and being in their good graces is billions and millions of dollars in advertising revenue. Mm. And they have a very specific mandate. And then in a sit-down interview with The Daily Wire's Jordan Peterson, RFK Jr. not only praised Rogan and former Fox News host Tucker Carlson, went so far as to say that podcasts offer insurgent candidates a platform and will ultimately decide the 2024 campaign. Let's listen. Tucker is 10 times what CNN is, you know, gets, and, and uh, Rogan's audience is potentially 10 times what Tucker was getting. So I think the I think the podcasts have the capacity this election for reaching people and allowing you know sort of dissident and insurgent candidates like myself to end run the corporate media monolith and to reach large numbers of Americans without going to, to onto the networks. So I think that's obviously true about the second half of that. Not all podcasts are made the same. Joe Rogan's podcast is a media juggernaut, the likes of which very few independent or corporate media outlets have managed to I can't to overstate the importance of web-based alternate platform <laughs> news shows enough. They are the future. They are the deciders. I mean, they, they are. And re remember back in 2020. We, we are the deciders. <laughs> okay, all right. We get it, Robbie. Remember back in 2020, um, when Bernie Sanders went on Joe Rogan, or he was invited on Joe Rogan, there was a huge media backlash, I think in part because there was a recognition about how that was an end run around the mainstream media. And at the same time that all of the establishment candidates claimed to find it to be distasteful because some of Joe Rogan's beliefs were not Bernie's beliefs or not progressive beliefs at all, it turned out that every other candidate, or many of the other leading candidates, including Joe Biden, were furiously trying to get on Joe Rogan's show, and Joe Rogan wouldn't have them <laughs> on. And Joe Rogan talked about Donald like, Trump too. He said he wouldn't past. have Donald Trump on. Right. So you know, there is something that is is uh, democratizing about independent media because the gatekeeping that happens in mainstream media cannot happen. At the same time, of course, there are independent people who can make their own decisions, which means a different kind of ideological narrowing. Effect Effect can happen mm -hmm. as well. Joe Rogan, I think, is popular in part because he does occupy this kind of fluid ideological middle ground where he is at times more culturally conservative, but not that culturally conservative, just more kind of normy, I would say, and has these moments of mm -hmm. being genuinely economically populist and left. He was someone who said he would vote for Bernie Sanders, et cetera. And that's where a lot of Americans are in that, again, the corner of the pie graph that doesn't get represented by mainstream news. So there is something to that. Right. I, I will say the point Joe Rogan made there about that there's no money in agreeing with RFK Jr. strikes me as a little funny because obviously that like Joe Rogan agrees with RFK Jr. <laughs> and is like the most successful podcaster mm -hmm. of all time and is making a killing. And then, you know, Joe, uh, uh, RFK Jr. is on with Jordan Peterson, who's uh, a, a commentator for the Daily Wire, which is like this super successful um, conservative media organization that has tons of money. It, it was prepared to throw Steven Crowder $50 million, which he laughed at as insignificant, not, not even enough. So wh while I absolutely agree with the overarching point that, yes, the mainstream media is very bought into positions that are taken, you know, that overlap with what the pharmaceutical industry wants in ways that I think can be harmful and structure the conversation, although usually not exactly because of direct advertising pressure, but just because of like the, ideo the ideology in my, I, I disagree, let me fin finish my point and then you can say what you think is wrong with it. But mostly it's just an ideological predilection toward the same kind of, the, the elite um, view over, happens to align with the everybody needs to get vaccinated, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I see the, you know, the point he's making about the power of money and, and, and mainstream media. There is also money being made in being critics of that. You can be successful. Um, you're, you're, you, we, I, we can't all pretend we're just like 
these dissident voices screaming in the darkness without it, you know, brave truth tellers, not like that can also be lucrative and profitable. When your critique is superficially, even substantively counterculture and anti-establishment, but doesn't call for any changes that are actually threatening to the establishment, you are likely to find a lot of people with a lot of money that are willing to fund your ideological project, your media project, because you don't actually challenge their ability to make money under the system as it currently exists. And so while there is obviously a lot of money to be made by people who brand themselves as the intellectual dark web or heterodox thinkers, and there's a whole media culture about that, mm -hmm. which I am engaged in and a part of in some small way, there's a difference in terms of how much money people earn and how much of a platform they have between people who are saying, you know, Biden is bad and ma mandates were bad, et cetera, but who aren't advancing a kind of politics that would go to the heart of the pharmaceutical industry, cutting subsidies to the pharmaceutical industry, making a critique of how it is the Democratic Party and Republican Party both take millions of dollars from pharmaceutical lobbyists every year, et cetera. And this is something that, I'm sorry, Bernie Sanders used to say all the time. You know, you have to look at who somebody's enemies are and who they're coming after and who they're not coming after. And, you know, I, this is part of why I do appreciate RFK Jr. because he does make, I think, a more substantive critique than most that are kind of in this broader universe. He said on his Twitter spaces the other day, specifically, that there was this moment where Democrats historically did not take as much money from the pharmaceutical industry. They were critics of it. They tried to pass various kind of health care reforms. But then when Obama tried to pass Obamacare, RFK Jr.'s critique was that he had to make a compromise to get it through Congress. He nego he, he, the compromise was no negotiation over um, health care, uh, over um, pharmaceutical prices. This hugely is, it's popular to nego have negotiation. Every other country does it. It's why insulin is a tenth of the price in Canada, et cetera. But he threw the people under the bus to get Obamacare passed. And from that point on, made an unholy alliance, I think those were his words, between the Democratic Party and the pharmaceutical industry. And he talks specifically about how much ab uh, pharmaceutical advertisements you see now that was previously prohibited in, for most of American history, it is now allowed. He talked about why it is that you see advertisements for you know, Raytheon and defense companies on Morning Joe, and it's how it's not because anybody who's watching Morning Joe over their cup of coffee is gonna buy a ballistic missile, but it's because there is this relationship uh, between the people with money and being able to control these media enterprises. And independent media, if it's not really independent because it's relying on ad dollars, is subject to those same kinds of things. You brought up the Steven Crowder example. Steven Crowder had his blow up because his prospective employer said, well, if you get canceled by YouTube, if we can no longer make money off of you and sell YouTube ads based on your show, we're going to have to pay you less money, which from a business perspective is perf perfectly reasonable. But that illustrates to you how it is that there's always these um, tensions between the financial incentives that are causing these shows to be so successful and the content and free speech desires on I mean, the other side of it. All, okay, but there are always financial incentives. I mean, you can be just somebody out on your own making videos. Uh, your your model is you have subscribers or something. I mean, if you if you go against what they think, if you infuriate them constantly, then they're going to stop subscribing. And you're not like it, it, it's not charity, right? This is, this is news and entertainment. We're all we're it's part sure. of the business. Sure, there are, there are those kind of incentives right. as well. But I think there's a very different thing. You know, my point was you can raise money, you can be very successful by yeah. advancing these anti mainstream ideas. And there's tons of examples of people doing that. I think that's true. I just, I'm just saying that there's limits, and when advertisers are involved, it becomes less, mm -hmm. you know, I'm Brianna, and my audience isn't going to like it if I say uh, capitalism is good, actually, so mm -hmm. I'm going to stay away, you know. <laughs> or maybe my audience won't like it if I say, oh, I went on a shopping spree and spent money that you think is inappropriate given that I'm talking about, you know, mm -hmm. socialism and redistribution. Let's say that's a more likely sure. example. Sure. <laughs> um, I see you. I see. I see you shopping over there. You know. You know. So uh, you know that I think that's a very different thing than me saying I'm running advertisements for J.P. Morgan's credit card services, or I'm running advertisements for you know something that is ideologically antithetical to everything that I do. 
And, and I think that has an effect. And I think RFK Jr. agrees that it has an effect. Um, and that can exist even in independent media. The, the incentives are different. I'm just saying there's no escaping that at the end of the day, you're relying on the kind of integrity of the person involved, plus all of the financial incentives that are heaped onto their shoulders. Sure. Well, former President Trump and GOP presidential candidate Donald Trump seemed to take a page from RFK Jr.'s playbook yesterday. He released a statement announcing his Agenda 47, a campaign to tackle the growth of chronic illness and health issues, especially in children, writing, quote, too often our public health establishment is too close to big pharma. They make a lot of money, big pharma, big corporations and other special interests, and does not want to ask the tough questions about what is happening to our children's health. What do you make of this? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's uh, tr Trump uh, is probably perceiving that RFK Jr. is getting a lot of pickup from echoing some themes that Trump himself has echoed. Um, although Trump, of course, famously has been was responsible for Operation Warp Speed and has not shied away from celebrating that uh, he's, he'll even tell audiences of right wing people who like yeah. Trump, except for what he's done on the vaccines, and he'll say, okay, that's, I, I watched him do this, he say, okay, that's your perspective, but remember that there are millions of people who desperately wanted the vaccine, and we're happy to take it as fast as possible, and I never said it should be forced on them, I'm not for any mandates, but uh, it, it providing people that potential if they wanted to, to do it was very important. Um, and yeah. honestly, that, and that's a pretty good, I think that's a perfectly yeah. fine uh, message to Look, have. If, but if Trump can inject some nuance into the conversation, <laughs> Trump can jab some nuance oh. into the conversation about um, public health by being someone with the position of having fulfilled a public health need at the same time as acknowledging that some of the public policy mm -hmm. um, follow-ups were not necessarily well-tailored. That's a good thing. Now, it could be that his audience just turns on, on him and he doesn't inject nuance into it at all. But I do also think that the, the broader point of saying, I'm going to offer something affirmative to solve a problem that exists, which is our children's health issues, is exactly the kind of thing that he needs to start doing so that his entire personality is that I'm being prosecuted by the state. Because mm. as we talked about in another segment, you know, unless there are some of these red herrings uh, or some of these smoking guns rather that he and Comer and others purport to exist in some of the documents that have not yet been disclosed, he's going to run out of rope on his ability to make a lot of that for the next 18 months into the election or however long it is. He's going to have to say, remind people of what his affirmative agenda is instead of just doing grievance politics for the next year and change. Mm. Well, we'll have more rising right after this.